Okay, I have four o'clock. Go ahead and get started. Joe, uh, we're all set. Yeah, we're good. I think we got everybody here. All right, thank you. So uh, welcome to our Condor Zoom chat, July 28th. Uh, we have uh, many updates to provide and uh, I wanna start with uh, an update on our uh, rebuilding of the Condor Sanctuary in Big Sur. Uh, it was um, obviously, to many of you, you know, it was destroyed in the Dolan fire in uh, 2020. And uh, we've been working on permitting all this time. Um, it's taken a long, long time, but we were just given the official news that we can pull the permit any day now. It is ready to be pulled. So that means uh, the permit's been fully approved. And I want to big, uh, give a big shout out to Paul Davis Partnership, the architects that... Uh, uh, not only drew up the plans, but worked with the engineers and also worked with the county to get us to the permitting uh, place in permitting where we are today. And we hired Madrone Industries to oversee the construction work and JBW Construction is out there working on the Condor pen. Uh, and also want to give a, a, a shout out to Coast Prefabrication, who's uh, building the cage portion of the release facility. So we're we, uh, really excited. We hired really great uh, local uh, contractors that are well qualified and doing great work. And we're just really pleased to support them in this process uh, to rebuild. So that's all I have, Joe. Just want to welcome everybody. And uh, once again, thanks for coming tonight and hope to see you on the next Zoom chat. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, excited to be back for another, another monthly update here. Um, we have a surprise guest with us today, Mike Clark, down there on our panel. Um, he's going to jump in at, at a point. We're going to give an update on 171 today, and he was right there for that 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 whole saga. So, really appreciate Mike popping in for our Zoom to give us a firsthand update. And of course, just update you on the flock and what's happening. Not only flock, what's happening with the crew. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've had an exciting month. Uh, you know, definitely a lot to update on when you say, Darren, we got a, kind of had a lot. We had a really, really busy month, accomplished a lot, um, had some ups and downs with the birds. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, always a team effort. I get to work with really amazing people. And today we have um, Darren Gross, our crew leader, and we have Kara Fadden down there. I see you on the panel, Karen. <laughs> uh, not with us today are Danae Mouton and Evan McGreef. Uh, we rotate through everybody's super busy and, uh, they'll, they'll potentially be in next month, but, uh, again, big shout out to them and all the, the big efforts they made this month. Um, yeah, this is a photo here of, we just finished, we moved up the uh, nest cam this month. We're going to talk about it later in the update, but, uh, it was a team effort getting everything up there, but, uh, pretty exciting to have that nest still going. Um, so we're looking forward to updating you on that. Yeah, so the crew did some exciting training. I love the photos. Uh, Darren, you can probably explain, but safety is always paramount when we're out in these remote areas working, and there's no better training than wilderness first aid training. And uh, we have to do this every couple of years. And it really is, uh, it, it's definitely like learning, fun learning, wouldn't you say, Darren? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, I mean, the knowledge that and experience we get from this training is extremely valuable, but we yes, as you can see from these photos, it was also a lot of fun um, just to do that for a weekend. Um, yeah, Carol, I'll ask you to jump in here to explain the first photo. Um, but uh, yeah, it was part of the training here. Yeah, so we were working on kind of different carries and different ways that you could carry an injured person out of the back country. Um, so this was the first one that they showed us, um, just a good carry because you can stay all single filed. Um, but then we ended up having a race against the other team. So it was us three versus three other of the people in our group. And yeah, there's it's a little different than carrying an eco out, huh? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And what's up with the neck brace there, Darren? Hopefully that wasn't a real injury. Yeah, no, I mean, um, not not a real injury in this instance, um, but yeah, the uh, a big part of um, the training was learning different splints that we could use with uh, just by having certain like malleable materials on us. And so this is an example of um, there's something called a SAM splint that's basically just this large rectangular uh, bendable um, uh, 
just piece of material, I guess. And uh, yeah, you can kind of bend it to whatever you need. And so we were learning how to make neck braces with, with this. Um, and that's all, it was very comfortable. I actually did not want to take it off. <laughs> I, I couldn't move my head around, but I also didn't have to support my head with my neck at all. So it was, uh, it was quite nice. A good, uh, is, I mean, good, yeah, yeah, good substitute for like a neck pillow, um, <laughs> as our instructors said. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, overall though, the training was, um, uh, so it was like, so valuable for, for all of us and, uh, and, but, and also a lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, we're always preparing to save and rescue the birds, but this is a scenario that always could happen and we just want to be in front of it. So yeah, glad that all went smoothly. Uh, rebuild update. Kelly mentioned, uh, uh, that we got our permit finally for the, to start the cabin, but this is the late, these are the latest photos from the, um, release pen. So this would be the observation blind and part of the blind will be an observation room. And the other part would be these ISO pens that we isolate the condors in before we switch out radio tags, take blood samples, that sort of thing. So this is, it's starting to take shape, which is really exciting, you know, for me at least to see it uh, kind of come into fruition. Still got a little ways to go on this. Uh, it's gonna, we still have to put the siding on and whatnot, but uh, there's, it's, it's getting close. So we're pretty excited. And uh, the flight pen cage is being fabricated as I speak and uh, it's almost completed. And then the big part of that will actually be installing it. Um, we got to hike everything. Everything for this site is, there's an added logistic of just getting stuff carried down to the site down this really steep hill. So it, uh, it always factors a little more time into your, into your construction. So pretty exciting to see it taking shape. Um, and here's what it looks like from the outside. All the windows and doors are in and the roof's almost sealed. And uh, yeah, we're going to, this thing, I have some really nice metal siding and it's going to be really fireproof this time. And uh, we're looking at mid-August to finish this portion, the observation blind, and hoping by the end of September to have the flight pen, the flight cage installed and the entire release pen finished. Um, that's a lofty goal, but I think we can do it. Um, and obviously we're, we're trying to get to that finish line because we really do need to recapture some of these birds. Um, some of our older birds uh, haven't been captured in a couple of years and we need to get uh, replace their transmitters. Obviously, uh, we want to know if something happens to them. We want to be able to find them. So um, those transmitters are really key. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. But yeah, we're, we're making big time headway. And um, big shout out to the construction crew. Um, they've, been, they've been definitely pushing pretty hard up there. And yeah, we're excited to get the cabin going. Hopefully by late August, we'll, we'll start break ground on the, on the cabin. So exciting times. Stuff's finally kind of coming around. So uh, it's really awesome to see. And Joe, I bet you you're really pleased that the county allowed us to move forward with the condor release facility ahead of the bunkhouse. Yeah, that was pretty key because that was uh, obviously the release pen is really the most critical structure in terms of the birds. Um, you know, the cabin definitely helps because it supports us, but uh, really the release pen is, is our A number one goal right now. And, you know, we always are trying to think of the birds first. So really, yeah, that was really uh, fortuitous that we were able to get going on that. Well, we got some great momentum and everything's in place now and we've got good weather ahead of us. So hopefully we'll get a lot done this fall. Yeah, almost too good. <laughs> <laughs> a little too warm, I would say. Yeah, lots of water, lots of hydration. <laughs> Um, yeah. But it's can't beat the view when you're working. It's doesn't lack inspiration. That's for sure. So cool. Yeah, we're getting out here to 171. And again, big thanks to Mike for joining us. Um, he was there to really help 171. He's he's known this bird a while. Mike has helped us in years past on nest entries into some of her old nest sites to help us handle eggs and chicks. So he knows this old gal pretty well, Traveler. Um, so when he heard that she was pretty sick and at Oakland Zoo and um, that she needed surgery, he was the first to jump in and um, he was able to contact Lighthawk and get a special flight arranged for her first class down to LA Zoo and, uh, and get her lined up for surgery with, uh, they have a couple of specialized vets down there that can only, there's only I think one or two now, Mike, uh, jump on in here introduce Mike here, but yeah, there's only one or two vets that can actually perform the surgery. So this was, we had to bring her down there. Yeah, well, we, um, thanks for having me, by the way, uh, Mike Clark from LA Zoo. Um, we, um, Dr. Klaus, Dr. Stephen Klaus is kind of our, our surgery specialist, and he's done a lot of the uh, condor abdominal surgeries uh, for 
lead fragments to remove lead fragments and for a lot of the um, Southern California birds that had uh, micro trash uh, in some of these uh, these uh, nestlings that we would we would go into the nest and check on their uh, health and they would be a lot of them would have trash impaction in their uh, ventriculus and crop and, and uh, he'd be the one that would do most of these surgeries. So Dr. Klaus, you know, everybody needs to thank him for his expertise. He's just an amazing, amazing surgeon. He, he makes look something really, really difficult, look really easy. And, and um, we're, we're really lucky to have him. Um, yeah, so when I heard that um, 171 was, was at Oakland and they, were they weren't having much luck getting her to regurgitate the, uh, the metal fragments that were in her stomach. And, you know, ha having treated so many birds at LA over the years, you kind of get the warning signs like, you know, if this isn't working, you got to do this and you got to go to the next step, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the, obviously we want to avoid surgery if at all costs, especially with the bird that's ill, you know, it's very hard for them to get through the surgery if they're ill and they're suffering from lead toxicosis. So, um, so timing was the key. I was, yeah. Right. Yeah. Time was when you have a lead fragment and you have a bird that's still alive, uh, they're not going to get any better than they are when you have them, the moment you get them, they're only going to decline. And the longer that lead stays in the stomach, you know, we're not assuming it's lead. We pretty, we think it's lead, but you know, uh, it, she had lead poisoning. She had very high lead in her blood. Uh, she had symptomatic, uh, you know, she had symptoms of lead poisoning, crop, crop problems, low weight, uh, lethargic, that type of thing. And so we pretty have to go with what, what we think it is. And so, um, seeing that there were metal fragments in the stomach and the fact that she wasn't having a good time eating or uh, casting, uh, we were urging them, let, let's, let's get this bird down here as soon as possible. Um, we consider, you know, any of these birds that have been out there 20 something years, like a VIP, like you gotta, you know, throw, throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. You got, we have to make this work. Yeah. And so I immediately got a hold of Christine at Lighthawk and uh, asked her if she had anything going on. And, by, and from, from the, between the time I found out about 171 and the time she was at LA Zoo from Oakland was less than 24 hours. And uh, awesome. so we moved really, really fast on that one. Hats off to Christine at Lighthawk and Lighthawk themselves for, for being able to move so fast. And, and uh, I'm going to forget his name, the pilot Bruce was his name. Yeah. Um, Do you know him, Joe? Mark Didon, right? Former board. Mark, right? No, it was right. Mark Didon. Bruce, Mark. Yeah, former Mark, yeah, former board and, member and for Ventana. Yeah, and he stepped up like right away and just said, "Hey, I'm, we're, let's do it." And and we got we got uh, the bird down here and was and she was uh, escorted by Oakland Zoo uh, staff. So we had a, a handler on board too, just in case anything, anything got weird. And then we got the bird back, and he flew her back to Oakland the same morning. So everything was really slick and we got her down there just the way it's supposed to work. And then just a few days later, um, Dr. Klaus uh, performed the surgery on the abdomen and pulled all the fragments out. Um, That's this photo that you took, I believe you took this photo, right? I don't see the shared thing, but I'm trying to find it. Yeah, it's the one of um, her laid out on the table. Yeah, yeah, I sent you a bunch of pictures. Yeah, exactly. And those, those pictures of the yeah, and I think a lot of folks wonder about that, like, because, you know, we, with birds, it's always unique when they go into surgery, we have, they have to be really careful when they um, put them under, right? I mean, they can't, uh, there's, there's yeah, different the, hazards the, um, putting down birds. The anesthetic is uh, uh, isoflurane gas, um, and it's pretty safe, um, but, you know, sick birds are, they're, you know, anytime you do anesthesia, you run the risk of, of an animal dying or just not waking up, you know? And so then you have the added situation with a bird that's sick and is, is being affected by lead poisoning. Then you have, it complicates it a bit more. So we have staff that's just, just watching the anesthesia, watching her uh, breathing, watching her heart rate, watching her oxygen saturation, everything's going on while Dr. Klaus is, is doing the, the surgery. And uh, Dr. Klaus was, was uh, also training and sort of uh, sort of training and, and mentoring one of our other vets to, to get her kind of on board with the surgery as well. So we're gonna have more vets that are more familiar with this procedure 
because we know we're going to have more in the future, as, as you know. Um, yeah, so the surgery really well. Um, we were able to uh, remove all of the all the fragments and all the hair that was in there. You know, it's a, a, if people don't know, the, the birds eat a lot of everything. You know, when they're out there eating, they're 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 not being very choosy about, about what they're eating. They're just grabbing food and swallowing it. They're not being very uh, about what goes down with the food when they eat it. So there's hair, there's pieces of pieces of dirt and grass and stuff like that stuck on the ground. And so all that stuff sort of gathers in the in the stomach. The stomach um, is the the food is then doused with hydrochloric acid and other enzymes to to sort of melt it down into a liquid form. And then uh, and and the stomach is expanded at that point with all the food in it. And as the as it empties out, it's left with all of what's called casting material, which is all the undigested uh, pieces of debris. And oftentimes that will be the pieces of lead that they've consumed that was in the meat. And uh, generally, if the bird can cast that out, when I, let me go back a little bit. A bird's like, like an owl, you, you heard of an owl, they eat everything and then they swap, they cough up a casting, which is a pellet. And uh, like a bird of prey, condors will cast up a, a pellet of hair and debris and pieces of rocks and so, stuff like that. And so that's how they naturally get rid of these fragments. Um, condors uh, eat very little casting material generally than, than uh, uh, in comparison to eagle or a hawk or a falcon or an owl or something like that. Uh, they, their, their food source is naturally low in casting. So you a cow or a horse or a pig and a deer, something like that, or the, the, the calves that we provide for them. And so there's not a lot of hair compared to body mass when, you, when it comes to them eating. So they're not eating a lot of casting material. A, 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 a golden eagle or a red-tailed hawk or something like that, they eat like a whole casting worth of hair or feathers or something like that every time they eat. And generally they'll cough that up within 24 hours and cleans out their stomach. It gets rid of that any debris that's in their stomach. Condors don't generally have that much casting material in the wild. And so the, the problem with that is that if you're not regularly casting, if there are lead fragments in there, these things aren't getting, getting uh, sort of coughed up in a, regular, in, in a regular timeline like it would be with a bird of prey. Um, and so that can be a problem for condors as they eat, they only have a little bit of casting and then they go to eat again on top of it. And now this, this lead is being re-exposed to uh, digestive juices. And over time, if it just stays in there, they're just getting poisoned over and over again. And so what we try to do in the zoo, uh, when we, and, uh, and we, we try to get them to get rid of it naturally. And so by doing what we call casting therapy is we'll feed the birds something with a lot of casting material like, uh, a lot of fur, like a rabbit or rats or something like that. If the bird doesn't want to eat it, we'll actually sort of encourage them by holding them and putting it in their mouth and closing their mouth and they'll swallow it. And then right after that, we'll give them something yummy, like some, some fresh warm meat or chicken livers or something like that, something that's really yummy. And they'll, they'll eat that on top of it. And so after they digest that, naturally about 24 hours later, they will cast up this ball of fur and hopefully those lead fragments will be contained in that. And uh, if we don't have any luck doing that, then we have to go straight to surgery and get, get it out. Because yeah, that works most of the time. The, the casting therapy you guys have done in the past has been pretty successful. I mean, it's unusual we get to the surgery point like this, right? Yeah. Well, generally what happens, well, she, she's a, a kind of a, a, an odd case and I'll tell you why in a second. But normally if, you, if we have a bird that is still a uh, has motility in the crop. You know, one, one of the symptoms of, of lead poisoning in a condor is they get what's called crop stasis. And uh, lead is a neurotoxin and it affects the nerves and the muscles. Uh, and the, so the, the crop is a, is a muscular sort of extension of the ex esophagus. And it's a place where the bird holds food while it's waiting to digest it, basically. It's just a storage area. There's no digestion that, that occurs in the crop. Well, what the crop does is it sort of squeezes the food over into the clavicle and then down into the stomach. And so it just keeps squeezing it over time. And you can see them sort of doing this on occasion if they have a really big crop full of food. Um, a lead poisoned bird that's symptomatic often will have 
crop stasis, which means the crop doesn't work anymore. So the food goes in and then it just sits there. So if we're feeding a bird a bunch of fur and feathers or something like that to get it to cast, it may not work because the crop is not pushing that food down into the stomach. And so we really have like sort of this roadblock there. And so we really can't use the casting material. And generally, if they have a, a crop stasis, they also have an inability to cast as well. So the, so the paralysis moves all the way down into the stomach. Um, you know, that, that's kind of theory, but that's just the way it the, the sort of works. If there's, if there's paralysis here, there's generally paralysis in, in the upper the whole GI, GI tract. Yeah. 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 So um, generally, if we have a bird that doesn't have a uh, crop stasis, we can definitely get, uh, we're very successful with the casting therapy. Um, if not, then it's, it's urgent that we get it to, to surgery. Because she was partial or is she fully, I don't think she was full crop stasis. Was yeah. She? So what, what I meant by, by I meant that, that um, we were giving her uh, food and stuff like that, but she kept regurgitating, which was, which was promising because the fact that she was able to regurgitate uh, was a good sign. Uh, that shows crop function. She, it, she's able to remove food from her crop, crop and throw it up. And so, um, yeah, so that was something that was encouraging. So when we got her from uh, Oakland Zoo, um, she, she was in a lot better shape than I imagined she was going to. And uh, she came out of the crate, you know, bright eyed and really well hydrated. They did a really good job keeping her uh, with, with, with good supportive care up there. They just didn't have any luck uh, getting her to cast and, and neither did we. So um, we tried the casting therapy as well. And um, yeah, she just, just kept uh, regurgitating all of her food. And so it's as that weight goes down, down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we wanted, we wanted to do the least, the, the least invasive version Totally. if at all possible um and so she's still pretty strong she was still above 15 pounds and so uh it was time to, to do the surgery and so um yeah and you yeah, say so, you said 15 pounds but for folks to know she's normally around a 20 pound bird so yeah. that's pretty that's a she's dropped a quarter of her weight um yeah. and so you know i know mike you've seen so many birds come in over the years and that fifth when they get start getting below 15 pounds is when you guys start yeah, when you hit that, when you hit 14 and below, that's, you're really in a tailspin at that point. Um, even for females, females are a little smaller, smaller, but, um, yeah, but now she's doing great. Um, we started offering her, um, what, well, what was the, the big scale? You'll see that bowl there that was full of, um, warmed up organic chicken livers and it's something that's just really bloody it's a very light food like if you think about a liver for how big it is it's very light and when you have a crop that has stasis the weight of the food can really drag it down like I, when i when i talk about crop stasis in a condor because condors have such a big crop for for how big they are uh they can hold about and i've tested this i've uh had a tame bird that i was able to have. weigh <laughs> <laughs> i've tested yeah uh, a female can eat uh, about three and a half to three and three quarter pounds of food and hold wow. that in the crop. And so that's a big, you know, you have, you have a chick in the nest somewhere, you know, a hundred miles away and you got to carry that crop all the way to the chick. And then you can feed yourself and feed the chick for a couple of days with that crop. Um, and then you have a, a pair doing that. Now you're talking about a nice supply of food. Um, so, uh, but with that, all that weight the crop when it's 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 sort of paralyzed it, it sort of behaves like imagine a hefty bag that holds you know 33 gallons and you dump a gallon of water in it what's it going to look like it's just going to be like a a, a a weight of water at the bottom of this hefty bag it's all saggy and it's not it doesn't have any uh it doesn't have any uh meat to it at all it just it just sags it has no movement to it but uh a healthy crop is something that is it's, it, it squeezes and it squeezes the food and it moves it upwards and it and it's uh it's 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 active um and so with her giving her the chicken livers um she loved them right away we gave her about 150 200 grams to start with and then the next day she still had a little bit of a crop but some of it was gone and there was no regurgitation she hadn't regurgitated or anything so um the next days we increased it and increased it and, and increased it. And now we're on full solid food. Um, her, uh, we've given her all kinds of different things or her, um, some of it she turns her nose up at and other things she um, really likes. And uh, so we're just giving her mostly what she likes, which is rabbits. She really likes rabbits. She'll, she, she just devours them. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's pretty much it for her. So we're just waiting for her to gain weight. Um, she got down to 15, right around 15 pounds was her lowest. Uh, and she stayed that way for about a week and she's slowly gaining weight now. Um, we're not treating her right now, her, um, other than just giving her food. We're just leaving her alone. We were treating her every day for some, you know, with some kind of uh, um, medications, calcium EDTA and giving her fluids. Now she's drinking on her own, eating on her own. Um, we haven't seen her cast yet. We've seen her try to cast, but it hasn't happened. Um, she only just recently started getting food that had casting material in it. We wanted to give her stomach a long time to heal. And now she is eating rabbits like every day. So she doesn't get a fast day at all. We give her food every single day. We're just trying to get bulk her up so we can get her to a point where we start thinking about getting her back out to Big Sur. Yeah, because you were saying you were thinking she's about 16 and a half pounds without a crop, you were guessing? Yeah, well, I just weighed her, not yesterday, the day before, um, I think it was. And yeah, she was 16, 16, six, I think she was. Yeah. And that was surprising to me because she hadn't really eaten the day before she didn't, we were giving her rats and she's like, yeah, I'm not, not but I, you know, I couldn't help, you know, awesome freaking effort what you guys did down there. And, uh, but I think it really speaks to you, what you guys do. I mean, you just articulated the behind the scenes, just the nuances yeah. Uh, the stuff you've learned, I mean, just the stuff you guys have learned as a team on how to better care for these birds in these really rough places, you know, they're, when they're in these rough, uh, really bad spots, um, just, just hats off, man. I mean, just, I'm always blown away by hearing how you manipulate and really make, make, reduce the stress. Cause I mean, we always talk about it, how you know, these birds coming in from the wild, you know, they're not happy to be in captivity. They want to be back out. And, no, and, and uh, to add to that, figured out awesome ways to really reduce that stress so hats off man yeah yeah we try to handle them that you know you 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 think of them i, I think of them as a you know you got a, a somebody who's in the icu in the hospital you know and um when somebody's relaxing in the hospital trying to trying to uh recover you don't run in there and hey wake up we're gonna treat you you know you go <laughs> how are you doing are you doing all right let's let's keep the anxiety to a low with the, a, the dull roar see if we can get these injections in and stuff. And the, and the handling is, is real slow and deliberate. And she never really gets all that upset when we have to catch her up. I got to the point where we just sort of pick her up and she kind of cooperates with it. And um, yeah, that's just, that just comes with doing it for so long. Now we're grateful to have you, man. And the whole, everyone yep. else down there, you guys really have it down to a, a sweet science and the birds are definitely, um, are, are definitely glad to have you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I kept thinking about 171. I mean, I, I didn't know if you remembered, but do you remember the, the year, the first year we went into her nest? The quay nest? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to date, one? but 2008. <laughs> wow. Because she's a 25-year-old. She's one of our, she is our oldest female in Central California. But, uh, yeah, I remember um, getting into her nest the first time with uh, Scott and Joseph and uh, Scott Strabinski and Joseph Brandt and you came along and uh, yeah, it was exciting time because she was all these, we had all these young nesting pairs and she was one of them and kind of led the way. So I know it was funny when I remember when I said, Oh, 171 might be sick. You perked right up. <laughs> You're like, oh yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to hear that story. <laughs> I want to have something to do with the recovery. I don't want to be just a spectator. Let's, Let's get this done. We need to get her back. We, we, we can't lose her. Yeah. So again, man, thank you for everything. And uh, yeah, from Oakland Zoo to you guys, it was a team effort. Um, and also, uh, you know, when she was brought in out of the wild, she was captured by the Pentacles crew. Um, so big shout out to them for uh, recognizing that she was sick and, and capturing her right away. So again, it just, it takes a village, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What Without them, we would have not, maybe never even found her, you know? Yeah. And that's what happens many times. So uh, we got lucky, but again, it wouldn't happen yeah. without you guys. So um, cool. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in, Mike. Uh, I know you're, you're busy, but uh, yeah, I think everyone appreciates the behind the scenes details about how you were caring for her, Cause I know I do. So I love hearing all the, all the, all the uh, behind the scenes stuff. So thanks for joining, man. Yep. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Have a good day, you guys. See you, Mike.
and uh yeah so we're we're guessing uh you know we're playing it by ear but we're hoping you know in the next month she'll be back out but again we're not going to rush it you know we're going to base it on what la zoo is telling us and uh what mike and the experts down there are letting us know so that's the 171 update thanks for joining us mike um oh now we're jumping into Yurok redwood uh yeah, they had, they released their last bird. I think that was in our last, up, no, that since our last update, they've released the final bird, A1, that everybody had been waiting uh, to see go out. And yeah, we heard from Chris yesterday, uh, up Chris West at the Yurok uh, release group, and, or Yurok tribe release. And he was saying that uh, all four are doing pretty well. They're definitely spending a lot of time around the pen, but occasionally making uh, little test flights and getting to know the area. Um, so anything else you want to add, Darren, on that? Um, not really. I mean, just I think it's it's funny to kind of see the just the um, similarities between what we noticed with our San Simeon birds, too. I know it's a little different because the San Simeon birds have other uh, wild condors around with them to, to show them around a bit. But, you know, it's it's a, it sounds like it's being a like really similar process, just where the birds bit by bit start expanding more and more. Yeah, baby steps, and it takes a while. You know, you're, we always joke you're on condor time. You know, it takes these young birds. You don't you don't want them to rush. You want them to kind of take their time and stay close to the mentor. And before you know it, that next release group's going to be out, and that's going to definitely spur things along. Yeah, um, I think that's going to definitely kick things into gear down there or up there. Sorry, up there. Mm. <laughs> we used to be in the we used to be in the most northern release. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, no, it's really cool. So yeah, things are going well up there, and. Uh, Hats off to them as well. Oh, we got a video. Um, let's see here. Oops, nope, that's not it. Yeah, this isn't playing, so I don't know. I'm gonna go to the next slide. <laughs> Good deal. Do you know what the video was? Just so I can. Um, I'm not sure. It may, it... Maybe it was, I think it might've been a photo that didn't load up. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, now we got the uh, California population update. Um, let's see, we're at uh, 87 in the population. That includes 82 free-flying birds um, and three chicks in nest. What the 82 free-flying, we have uh, two birds in captivity. Right now we have um, 171 who we talked about and there's also a pinnacles bird, uh, 745 that's in treatment at Oakland Zoo for a lower lead level. Um, that bird appears like it's gonna recover just fine. And uh, so right now that uh, those are the two that aren't out in the free flying population. Uh, condor deaths, uh, we had one death since the last uh, Zoom chat, Condor 972. Um, unfortunately, that bird uh, was found by Pinnacles uh, that died, that bird died in uh, early part of July. And uh, again, this bird was just um, hitting its prime, you know, just, four years old. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's always sad to see them go when they're just, just getting started. So, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, we're at seven total for the year. Um, this time last year, just for perspective, we were at 11 deaths. So, um, you know, it's always no deaths are acceptable, but, uh, you know, we, we are encouraged that hopefully we'll stay below 10 this year. Um, or honestly, I hope we don't go higher than seven, but, uh, Anyway, the uh, chicks in the nest, we're going to talk more about later, uh, but we still have the three going strong. Nesting updates, you want to jump in, Darren? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I guess, Kara, if, if uh, you want to jump in and talk a little bit about 1174. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think as a lot of you guys have seen, um, we did install that nest camera. So you can kind of get some glimpse on that chick. Um, but yeah, still going strong. Um, mom and dad are still hanging out with the chick. Um, and we signaled dad there. We were, Darren and I were at base camp last night. So dad was at the nest um, last time we checked that on that. But I think our next slide might have some pictures or yeah, more pictures about it. So this picture is from 1095, um, 652 and 550's chick from last year, um, but at three months old. So this is kind of what 1174 
is looking like right now. And again, it's kind of hard to see in the camera just because there's so much kind of foliage covering that cavity. But if you were to see the chick, um, this is kind of what you, you would be looking at. Um, and I know that there's been, yeah, some, some wing flaps um, that have been caught on the camera by Cali Condor. Thank you so much again for Thank sharing you, with us everything, <laughs> everything you see and all of your visuals are so insanely helpful. Like I know we say thank you all the time, but it's very, very, very helpful. But yeah, it's cool to be able to watch this live camera because it's not the easiest of hikes to get up there. So um, it's nice to be able to check in on this nest like every single day. It's much easier than hiking up there, but yeah, so the I can't center, complain hiking up either. Yeah, the center photo really tells the story of why we can't see in there <laughs> with the yeah. blue circle. It's that right there in that blue circle. It's frustrating because if we could get to the other side of the tree, which is a deep, sizable canyon that just drops off into the abyss, we would be able to see right into the nest like we do at, at the, the uh, at Redway Queen's nest, where you can see right in. But the the orientation of the cavities opposite of the Anderson nest. So there's no good way to see it from the other side. And so we just get these little glimpses. We figured if we were gonna, zoom, if we zoomed in the cam, we would see the, like the upper right, I think that's one of the parents leaving after feeding, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. And then the bottom, that bottom left photo is the chick, pretty sure. You can see his little stubby wing right there flapping. But yeah, it's just these little mirror glimpses and you can see 477's tag down there on the right and the dark there. Um, yeah, it's an interesting nest where we've been kind of spoiled with our nest cams <laughs> the last four or five years. So this one's a little more challenging. And of course, Cali Condor and the explore.org viewers have totally stepped up and uh, taken it by the horns and are just finding any glimpse we get they're they're reporting on it. So that's pretty Yeah, awesome. it's cool too, because didn't, some I think maybe Callie or somebody else noticed that um, 936 was hanging out nearby too, who fledged from this nest. Like yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I think another young bird was there yesterday. 994 was hanging out uh, pretty close to the to the nest yesterday as well, which I think we had picked up by signal, Kara. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I believe I saw some comments this morning that some folks saw him on the nest cam uh, perched not on the nest tree but i think nearby yeah because yeah. 9, 936 yeah 936 fledged from uh phoenix and his former mate pinnacles female 547 who passed away um oh, wow. that's really cool to show and it's really that was really cool to see that's they come back to visit their old their old uh their old spot <laughs> We all go back to mom and dad's house every once in a while. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the chicks here as um, we have, we definitely have some updates on the uh, 2021 uh, chicks. So we had shown that photo of uh, 1095 a couple slides ago, of what he looked like basically a year ago at this time. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think, as I said, in our last Zoom chat, now that these chicks are getting older, they are, they are becoming more independent from their parents. So it's, uh, we get less uh, visuals of them with the parents. And so it gets harder for us to confirm their identities while they still don't have tags. Um, but we are starting to make some headway on, uh, on giving them tags, which we'll get into in a bit. But yeah, just a quick update on the last confirmed visuals. So 1089 uh, was last seen feeding at base camp uh, earlier this week. Um, 1095, the last confirmed visual of that bird was at the beginning of this month, um, also at the, at our big surf feeding slope. And then 1104, uh, that bird's just been harder to track because, um, it's, a uh, nest locations a bit further away from, from areas where we typically monitor and, and track. So our, the last confirmed visual of that bird was in late April with, uh, with its dad, 574. Yeah, and that's then, not, um, that's not too surprising, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, we're not, that's not a, any sort of um, sign of concern on our end. It's just that that's kind of how this goes while these, while these chicks, especially um, chicks like 1104, whose nests are further away or just harder to access. Um, we just don't see them as much even after they fledged. Um, and then still with 1077, we, um, we don't have any evidence uh, that, that we are uh, seeing that bird at this time. 
Yeah, we've seen 663 quite a few times and never with a untagged juvenile. So we're starting to lean more towards that that bird didn't make it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned uh, before, like we are starting to make some headway on uh, getting tags on these uh, fledglings from uh, 2021. So the first bird that uh, Pinnacles was able to trap uh, for us, 9006, uh, it's a bird, a bird with a blue tag with this white six painted on it. Um, yeah, we have the genetic, the genetic results in to confirm who that is, and that bird is uh, 1089, so 204 and 646 is chick from last year. Um, so that's really exciting, and we'll show some uh, visuals of that bird here uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, but also, that's also like that, with that information that came in just this week, that helped us confirm a lot of visuals uh, for that bird just in the past month. So that's why we have the most recent kind of history confirmed for, for seeing that bird. And then another one of these, uh, previously untagged 2021 fledglings um, was also trapped by pinnacles uh, late last week, I believe early this week. And um, we just put a tag on that bird. So this temporary ID for that bird is 9,007. Um, so similarly, it's a blue tag with a white seven painted on it. And uh, yeah, the, the, we took blood samples from that bird on Tuesday and we've sent them off for, to, uh, to test genetics. Um, so we still can't say for sure that we know who that bird is until those genetic results come in. However, there are some pretty strong indications of who that bird could be uh, based on some other condor activity uh, that happened around when the bird was trapped over at Pinnacles and uh, during our handling. Um, and so what I'm referring to here is what's uh, at the bottom of the slide is that 574, uh, the parent of 1104 was present uh, basically during the whole period of us handling um, 9,007. And uh, we noticed, I'm not sure I shared this yet, Joe, with, with you or Kara, but when we did let 9,007 go, uh, five, that the bird started flying away and 574 flew uh, after it pretty shortly oh. after. So again, pretty we can't- strong. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Put it's a pretty- on, You put your money on that bird? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I have to. <laughs> it's staring me right in the face. Again, again, I can't confirm anything until the genetics are in, but uh, it does seem very likely that this uh, untagged bird that we just trapped 9007 is indeed 1104. Good deal. All right. What do we got going here? Yeah. The, uh, I think the video was too big. It's oh, okay letting me play it. So, um, oh, here we go. Nope, is it doing it? Yeah, there's, I think it's, uh, it's giving me a too large file. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry about that, folks. We'll have to post them somewhere else so you can see them. Oh, here you go. Here's another shot of them down there. Yeah, Carrick, uh, do you want to get into the, some of the wild feeding stuff we've seen recently? Yeah, sure. Well, I, it's funny, I was actually off during this whole event. Um, but as you can see, um, there were a bunch of birds down at a sea lion carcass just kind of feeding over a couple of days. Um, and I actually came back after this like major feeding event. Um, and there, the sea lion carcass was just like skin and bones. There was like nothing left but there was still, um, 10, 11 was still there hanging out. So it kind of shows what kind of event it was that even if there was, there was no meat left or anything, um, birds were still hanging out, but it was pretty cool to see. And I'm pretty sure that was the first time 10, 11 had been observed feeding on like non proffered food, which is what, I mean, we want these birds to be doing is feeding on food we're not providing for them, but obviously clean sources as well. Um, and then it was also cool because uh, 1089, who was still tagged as 9006, and another untagged were also feeding on this carcass at that time. So it was cool to just see kind of all these birds feeding on a sea lion carcass, doing what they do. Huh. Interesting. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Um. Yeah, nothing really, Kara. Yeah, thanks for thanks for covering that. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like it does seem recently we've had a few of these uh, sea lion carcasses wash up on the coast. So it's it's it has we've had a lot of great opportunity to see birds um, 
coming and going to, to feed on this, these nonprofit food sources, which is, as Kara said, is always really encouraging to us. And, um, uh, really like kind of proof, like just real hard proof of the, that what we're doing is, is, uh, is working and helping everything out. I always love it when you see the, the parents, you know, 204, you know, Amigo and Kadama bringing down their offspring, the untagged chick. I mean, it really captures kind of the birds kind of reconnecting, you know, that's the whole goal of what we're doing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's the ultimate reward for us. I think when we're out doing our work, <laughs> we see those moments. Mm -hmm. I know right. I wish I get that video to work today. Took, um, I'll figure out a way here, hopefully by the end, but yeah, yeah it was a f f video of the, um, if not, we'll post it on social media after this <laughs> of the chick feeding with uh, Kodama and Amigo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, as we mentioned, and I'll take this moment too, to even though that Evan D and Danae couldn't join us, they did a lot of work on this presentation. So just a huge thank you to them um, for all the materials they provided and, and to you, Joe, as well for, for uh, um, every, everything, putting this together and organizing everything here. Um, but uh, yeah, Evan, um, uh, as always, has put together an awesome map for, for us to share with you all. And so this is looking at um, feeding events from this past month uh, and parsing them out between um, the, the food that we've provided. And so the, the feeding events that have occurred from that. Um, and, also, and then against the, uh, the food that condors have been finding on their own. Um, so you can see, you know, it was, uh, there were more of like wild feeding events or, or instances where birds found food on their own, um, uh, in the past month than the feeding events created from the food that we've been putting out. And, and by that I'm covering the food that Pinnacles puts out over at their site. Um, the food that we put out in Big Sur and, and San Simeon, and then also our, our relatively new feeding site, Mary's Peak. Um, so I, if I think... You know, this is a cool breakdown to, to see um, just how how much because I, I know like the through the explore.org cameras and, and other other work that we do and what we talk about, you know, it's pretty clear that uh, that the feeding sites where we're providing clean sources of food for birds are very successful in bringing them in. But this really shows how much birds are finding food on their own as well. Um, and, and a question I'll get a lot when talking about condors is. Um, you know, are we providing food because they're unable to find food on their own? And I, and I think this map just shows how, how um, clearly, you know, the, the birds are, are able to, to find their, uh, to find sources of, um, of food on, on their own without us providing uh, food as their sole source of uh, sustenance. Um, but this is also, you know, the, the stuff where we're constantly monitoring and keeping an eye on to try to keep track of where birds are going and potentially picking up uh, lead and other contaminants uh, when they're feeding. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to share with, with you all um, this information and the stuff that we look at to, to really inform our work. Yeah, it really shows you the value of the GPS data, you know, how yep. we can literally get in the weeds. Um, and Evan's really good at that, getting in the weeds on this data and uh, making sense of it. And uh, I think this, you hit the nail on the head. We, you know, obviously the, we know the birds can feed on their own, but, you know, trying to offset some of that lead exposure they're getting out in the wild when they have these wild feedings is really our main goal of the, of the supplemental food um, to help, you know, kind of offset some of the exposure and, you know, with the work Mike's doing with getting the non-lead ammo out and um, getting a lot of these hunters and ranchers to switch over, you know, it's just a team effort all the way around, but you know, yeah, this, this data is really valuable. I know Mike's been using it as well to help uh, pinpoint areas to focus his non-lead outreach. So yeah, God, I can't believe it's almost been an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, God, what a great Zoom. It was awesome to have Mike on board today, Mike Clark. And um, again, we really appreciate everybody coming in to join us and get the updates on, on the flock. Um, our next Zoom chat is August 25th at 4 p.m. And uh, we hope you can join us then. We'll have a lot more exciting stuff to update, hopefully on the rebuild and on the flock and maybe even 171's return date. Um, uh, one thing we didn't talk about is, uh, and we'll get into it next, it's a little teaser for next update, is our next release cohort is 
definitely around the corner. And, um, and we also might, are having a couple of new interns join us um, that Darren and crew have just finished interviews. And I think they pulled the trigger on a couple uh, interns. So uh, we're excited to have some uh, new interns down. They'll be helping us at our San Simeon release site with these new pre-release birds. So uh, yeah, we'll have a lot more exciting stuff around the corner. And we'll know the identity of the latest chick. What was your bet again there? What was it? Uh, le- <laughs> said 1104? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. No, no doubt. <laughs> can't, can't turn back now on that. Yeah, I bet you there's uh, some questions we could answer too. We still have a little bit of time. Yeah, so that's what I was just going to get to. I know Mike's probably been down there getting, feeling, feeling as many as he can in the question zone, but um, fire away, Mike. Sure. Uh, uh, Darren, that map was really interesting. And there was a question that, that, that came up. Do we know the percentage of supplemental versus wild feedings? Um, I always thought that was really difficult information to get because we're always learning about where and when and how often birds will feed in the wild naturally compared to at our sanctuary or at one of our feeding uh, sites. And so you have here uh, 87 wild feeding events, 61 supplemental feedings. Uh, Could we come up with a percentage or is really just the point here that they are finding wild food? Um, Yeah, I think think we can start to get an idea, but but we don't really have the whole picture here. So, So something that is missing from this, I mean, to be clear, this is still like extremely valuable information. It does show that in terms of the number of feeding events that condors are participating in or finding, um, you know, in the past month, they did find more uh, in the wild outside of what we were supplementing. But we're not capturing how much food is actually present or that they're actually consuming at each of these events. Um, how many are without- on private lands? Yep. Yep. And yeah, especially with the wild feedings, it's very like, there's really uh, no way for us to, to be able to tell or, or calculate that at this point. Um, and we're, we're trying to work out ways currently to come up with some procedures to start um, monitoring how much food we're putting out in each of our feedings that, that we provide for the birds. But really without that element of knowing how much food birds are getting from each of these events, it's hard to, to really say with any um, certainty that they're getting more food from the wild feeding events versus the supplemental feedings. Right. And from the map there, it looks like there's a lot of activity on the east side of the Salinas Valley and not as much on the the coast. Uh, Rita wants to know what's up with that. I, I think it's accessibility. I'll let the field crew jump in right after, but I think a lot of it's accessibility. There's so many beaches where these birds are most likely foraging and we just can't ever see them. So they just go undetected, but anyway. Yeah, and it, it is just, it's, we don't have GPS on all the birds. This doesn't represent the entire population. This is just a, a 20, 20, maybe 20 to 25% of the birds. So um, yeah, and again, quantities at each of these sites isn't represented. So they could be getting far more at that one single site above on Big Sur that's right by the, the, the uh, diamond right by the Big Sur. You know, if we had a like a heat map, if we had showed how much we know they've got, you know, obviously you saw that big sea lion. Some of these other feedings could be as small as a ground squirrel. So it's kind of, you have to kind of look at it in, in that relative way. We're kind of looking at just more where they are picking up this, these wild feedings. We, and again, like Darren said, we just don't know the, the areas east of the Salinas Valley are very difficult to access. A lot of them are very large private ranches and it's a classic thing. Even if we did access them by the time we got there, the event would have already been done. You know, the feeding when they've already fed and moved on. So it's, um, that's, that's just a challenge we've always had, but I think the bigger picture is just really seeing the the frequency of food they're picking up on that, that east side. And I think it's personally a lot of smaller meals. Um, I think the coastal, what the stuff that washes up on the coast tend to be big meals and, and they'll, and very, and they'll hang, they're anchored into one site. Yeah, I, I can attest to that. I remember leading tours with Ventana uh, a few years ago uh, during a summer where a gray whale washed ashore and 
I enjoy just bringing the tour group down and saying, let's pull over here. I have a good feeling about this spot, knowing that I think there I might be a couple of, right over here, 20 condors swirling around me. <laughs> so uh, that happened for about five months straight. So they really kind of key in on those uh, marine mammal carcass uh, haul out spots. And so maybe they don't show up as being as numerous on the map, but they are very important. So uh, so they're, they're finding food really all across the range in Central California. And we're, we're just now really getting, uh, getting going on, on isolating those spots and learning more about how they are feeding in the wild and using that information to uh, help protect against lead exposure and, and directing our non-lead uh, outreach. Um, there, there are several questions about uh, 171 and, and specific questions, uh, uh, medical questions. And, and I apologize to those who, who asked that I, that I didn't get those in before, uh, before Mike uh, left. Uh, but there is interest in learning more about uh, uh, the intricacies of uh, operations versus uh, not operating and different procedures. And um, a question about uh, the transport of 171 and, and the treatment. And I guess in general, who pays for all of this stuff, like the flights and the, and the medical attention? Uh, who do we thank for that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, that's all donated. Um, and we can thank Lighthawk. Um, they not only fly sick condors, but they are going to be flying some of our uh, pre-release rookies that are coming down. Um, they also have been involved in flying eggs between some of the captive breeding facilities from Boise to LA Zoo. Um, and again, it's, it's a Lighthawk is made up of a fleet of volunteer pilots that own their own planes, typically smaller planes, not commercial size, you know, jets or anything. Um, and they donate their time and fuel and uh, airplane to do these, uh, to do these conservation flights to help condors. So big hats off to them. And, and actually one of the pilots was our former board member and uh, pg and &E biologist, Mike, Mark Didon, which was really cool, small world. Um, I remember he texted me during the flight, and I was, <laughs> which was really cool. And uh, cause you know, we never know which volunteer pilot they're gonna bring on Lighthawk is. And he kind of surprised us and uh, really cool, small world. But uh, yeah, he was really happy to help. He knew 171 from back in the day and was really happy that he was able to be a part in helping her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mark Didon a few years ago even helped us try to locate tricolored blackbirds. Uh, That's right. In plane. And so he's been- Yeah, very he's done flights for us over the years to help find missing birds. Um, that's the other main role for Lighthawk. If we have some condors go missing in Central California, I forgot to mention, but they, they'll go up and uh, radio to help us do aerial tracking for some of the radio signals if we have a bird missing. And, you know, it's important to note too, the, both Oakland Zoo and Los Angeles Zoo contributed, you know, all the veterinary time and all the resources they put into 171's care. Uh, you know, Pinnacle's field crew discovering the bird, our field crew helping to facilitate all of this and moving the bird around. You know, it was, like we keep saying, it, it really is uh, a village and uh, takes takes all of us. Yeah, well said. Uh, Joe, can you explain uh, what Mary's Peak is? is? Is that a feeding site? What What is that on our map that we're seeing there? Yeah, so that's a new feeding site. Um, we haven't drawn the birds to it yet. They're very close. Um, we think it's just a matter of time. And again, this is a, a, a new spot that um, Kelly can explain really the how we came across this property best. But uh, yeah, it's 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 presented an opportunity to set up a new supplemental supplemental feeding site to draw the birds to again to a clean food source over in this area where we know they get exposed to a lot of lead. Um, and it's a little bit, uh, just a little bit on the fringe of where they, their core area. So we know it's going to take a little bit of time, but we've had some really close calls in the last couple of weeks. And it's not if, it's when really, when they find, when they really cue into this. But uh, yeah, it's an exciting opportunity that developed. And again, it was some folks that wanted to help out the condors and had a property that they, they were no longer using full time and um, offered it up to us to use, to use for this conservation purpose to help the birds. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I'd be recognizing them, but they wish to remain anonymous. And uh, just you know, want to thank them uh, specifically, and uh, just anyone in general who can help out in, in this kind of way. It's as you can see, this is a really strategic, important uh, effort here because look at all that nonprofit feeding that's going on in that area. And if you know, in every meal that we could uh, put out there that has no lead in it is is going to help. So, um, in really concert with the non lead outreach and hoping to see the birds actually feed at Mary's Peak soon. Yeah, yeah. providing a, a safe alternative for them to forage. And so, it, it we hope that we'll hear more about uh, Mary's Peak and and when the birds find it and uh, how that affects their their foraging uh, behavior. We're, we're nearing the end, but I'm, I'm getting a flood of questions about Aniko. So uh, <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, where is Aniko? Uh, when's the last time we've seen uh, her? And uh, any, is there any information that, that you can provide about uh, her, her welfare right now? <laughs> Go for it, Darren. Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in here. So actually, um, I'm pretty sure it was, it was, I'm pretty sure I saw Nico a couple of days ago over in this area where you're seeing like some of these, uh, these red uh, diamonds representing the, the um, wild feeding events. So I was out there tracking a couple of days ago and I was uh, picking up her signal very strongly. And I saw a condor perched on the ground and there were other birds flying around and other signals that were really strong indicating that there were quite a few condors in that area. But yeah, she was just perched on the ground, kind of looking around. Um, it was pretty far. So I couldn't exactly see the, the, Black 31 painted on her tag, but I'm pretty confident it was her based on the signal and the visuals and behaviors I saw. And yeah, she's looking, I mean, she was looking good. Um, just, you know, being around with other birds, that's one of the most encouraging things we can see um, to, to assess the health of a bird is, is, you know, that they're with other condors and being social. And um, yeah, she's, she's doing great. Yeah, very good. And, and I, I enjoyed watching the condor cam today. I, I, I just, you know, checked in from time to time and I counted 25 different individuals and um, I saw a Pasquale running around uh, doing things. So it's fun to watch the condor cam. Uh, two real quick questions before we uh, sign off. Uh, we've been watching 745 uh, at, at the zoo getting uh, treatment and enjoying the misters. Now, the viewers want to know, is that something that we would consider uh, installing some misters for the comfort of, uh, of the condors? Oh yeah, we would if we could. It's, it's a water availability issue, really. We, we have water at the release site, but not at that level where we'd have misters. We actually did that in the past um, when we were holding birds. And uh, San Simeon too, it's, it's definitely a possibility, but Fortunately, San Simeon doesn't get as hot um, in the pen. You know, they, they've always got a nice breeze and uh, it tends to get the coastal influence, doesn't get as hot. Um, but yeah, we've we've had that as an option in the past. And if we saw a need for it, we could we can make it work. But yeah, that's great, great observation. And that's okay. great for captivity because the birds, again, they're by themselves. They're they're a little high, the stress is much higher than if they were in a release pen. Um, Again, they don't see any of their buddies. They're by themselves. So the mister is a good, good uh, kind of almost placebo distraction. It's just anything that can ease the stress. Like Mike was talking about the little, the little things they do behind the scenes just to kind of ease things for these birds because they're in a foreign place. I mean, they're captive, you know, they, they're wild birds that are captive and they, they definitely don't enjoy it. Well, it, 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 it seems like uh, the misters could solve the whole lead thing. You know, we <laughs> all those at the sanctuary, all the birds would spend their whole day at the <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't have time to forage it in dangerous areas, but, uh, but that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'll enjoy watching. I think stuff. the biologists would be in the misters too. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. Because it's that's been true. pretty hot up there. I think I might, that's they true. might that's be. I've been hearing that, that the temperature is really hot for you guys working up on, on the slope. Uh, our next Zoom is going to be August 25th. Now, crew, you've said that Traveler might be ready for release in what, three or four weeks. And so the question is, how can we keep up to date, you know, between the Zooms about Traveler? Is this going to be a, uh, a soft release? Uh, 
any details you might provide on on how people can uh, keep in the know regarding uh, a traveler and 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 her release yeah i mean the main way is social media through facebook instagram um and then also folks can sign up for our e-newsletter and get get the updates that way um anything else you want to add kelly like well, I, I think you might might have been asking a little bit more about the details of the release, and I don't I don't know what you have planned, but um, you know. Uh, oh, I, I'm saying just to follow that. I, yeah, the release is kind of it's. We'll see what, what we get to when we get to that road. You know, when we cross or that bridge when we right. cross it. But yeah, we will probably capture the release in some way. I don't know if it'd be a live streaming type thing, but we'll definitely. Um, it, it'd be a, uh, you know, it's going to be a great event to see her go back out in the wild. So we'll definitely capture video at a minimum of her getting re-released and, uh, you know, just to celebrate her going back out in the wild. And maybe, and maybe do it live at a certain time on the cam and Big Sur or something. But anyway, something to think yeah. about. Yeah. And there's certainly a lot of interest in Traveler's story, what she's been through, some of the specifics and, uh, and so we look forward to, to seeing uh, uh, the continuation of this uh, tremendous story. Join us August 25th for the next Zoom. In the meantime, the crew will be busy monitoring nests, uh, monitoring birds, doing the important work that they're doing. We'll continue our non-lead outreach, providing uh, free non-lead ammunition to hunters and ranchers through the Condor Range. And, and uh, really promoting the use of non-lead ammunition like we've done since 2012. Thanks so much, crew. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'll throw it back to you, Joe, and, uh, and we'll see you next time. I think you wrapped a bow on it really nice, Mike. So thank you and I'll hand it off to Kelly. But yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Big hats off to the crew. Thank you, Mike Clark, um, as always, for all the great work you all are doing down there at LA Zoo. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.